Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, pleased that you all came out to uh, visit with me and talk about the next century. Uh, it's, it's an auspicious moment to be doing that. Uh, I've thought about the next century since I was a small child, and it seems to be rushing upon us. Uh, the previous presenters showed us some interesting technology that's on the horizon. The presentation right before us talked about the possibility of extraterrestrial life. I'm going to talk about the possibility of a different form of non-human life, or non-human intelligence, I should say, uh, which is machine intelligence. And machines are showing a little bit of intelligence today, and I'm going to show you one example of that. But what are the prospects for the next hundred years? I think it would be difficult to look much beyond that. But this is a topic I've thought about for the last 20 years. I've been building a model, a mathematical model, of some characteristics of technology. Certain aspects of technology, like the power of computation, the price performance of computation, the, the capacity of computer memories, uh, human genome scanning speeds, brain scanning, miniaturization, all of these processes are growing at exponential speeds. And certainly you've all noticed this with regard to computers. You can hardly unpack your notebook computer before it's already obsolete. Every time you open up the morning paper, uh, there's more powerful machines, more capable software for less money. And that's been an exponential growth that people have started to notice. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that trend is going to develop over the next 20, 30, 40 years, and then what we're going to do with those resources. But I'd like to start by sharing with you a little 1999 technology. Actually, we should say this is 2001 technology, because it's not quite there yet. In fact, I gave the first demonstration of this, of this system just a few weeks ago to Bill Gates, and uh, actually made an interesting mistake, which I'll share with you uh, after, the, uh, after the demo. So this is not bulletproof, it's uh, kind of shaky, uh, but if it were bulletproof it wouldn't be interesting. Now, this system is going to recognize my voice, and then it's going to do some other things, which you'll notice very quickly. Uh, this piece of equipment here was loaned to me by Bill Gates' female assistant, who accompanies him around the Microsoft campus. It's a compact with a little mirror, which enables me to position the microphone. <laughs> uh, she forgot to ask for it back. Uh, Unlike the President of the United States, the, the bill on the West Coast travels with, uh, without much security, although maybe she has a, some security in her, in her uh, pocketbook, but uh, he, uh, he's pretty uh, inconspicuous as he walks around the Microsoft campus. Now, the acoustics in this room are a little unusual, so I'm going to calibrate the system on my voice. Testing, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. It's very good to be here. Comma. Okay, we got part of it done. Let's try it again. It is very good. It is... It is very good. It is very good to be here. Comma. In ihm ist sehr gut, hier zu sein. Now the system is hearing all of you, so...
with everyone. With everyone at America's Millennium, capitalize the last word. Period. Mit jedem bei Amerikas Jahrtausend. This is a demonstration. Kava. Dies ist eine Demonstration of a prototype of a quote translating end quote telephone period von einem Prototyp von ein das Übersetzen Telefon within a few years comma Innerhalb einiger Jahre. We will be able to speak to anyone, comma. Wir werden fähig sein, mit jemandem zu sprechen. Regardless of their language. Regardless of their language. Period. Regardless of their language. Period. Ohne Rücksicht auf ihre Sprache. Okay, let's try a different language here. Okay. The rain in Spain, comma. La pluja en España. Well, actually, I forgot to. That was the uh, German lady speaking French. <laughs> The rain in Spain, comma. La pluie en Espagne. That's better. It stays mainly in the plain. Period. Reste dans la plaine principalement. Okay, and we'll try one more thing. I'm going to speak French, not as well as the computer does, but the computer doesn't seem to mind. Okay. Merci pour votre attention. Period. See if it has the right translator. Okay. <coughs> Merci pour votre attention. Period. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> she's, she's a little slow. <laughs> the French woman's a little quicker on the on the uptake. J'espère que vous aimerez ma parole. Period. I hope that you will like my speech. Okay. <clears throat> This was combining uh, three technologies, and I think some of the most interesting applications of artificial intelligence that we'll see over the next decade are systems that combine multiple expertise. Uh, this is speech recognition, and that's technology that I've worked on uh, since 1982. And each year with more powerful computers, the speech recognition gets better because this is a technology that's 
been hungry for MIPS and megabytes, so every time the, the personal computers are more powerful, the speech recognition gets more uh, capable. And this can recognize people actually without being exposed to your voice. This particular version uh, has actually only heard me for uh, a few dozen words. Uh, the uh, speech recognition, as you saw on the screen, if you could see that, fed into a language translator. The language translations are not perfect, but they're actually quite adequate for translating things on the fly, so for casual conversations or business communication, it's really quite good. I use this translation software for web pages, so I can read web pages in, from Germany or from in Japanese, and it translates them on the fly, and uh, you def definitely get the gist of it. It's not literary quality. <laughs> And that feeds then into a new speech synthesis technology. That's, that's an area of technology I've been involved in since 1974. The first synthesizers, and you've probably heard them, sound very mechanical and robotic, and most of the ones still out in the field sound synthetic. This actually sounds human. It sounds like a recording of human speech, but that was not a recording. It's actually feeding in the text as it comes in and synthesizing it, but with a human voice and actually with some human inflection. Uh, and in about a year, uh, another version of this will be able to take a sample of your voice. You'll record a, a passage that it'll prompt you, and it'll, the synthesizer will then sound like your voice. So this translating telephone, you'll be able to speak English on your cell phone, and a friend of yours in Germany will uh, hear you in German. Uh, she'll speak in German, and you'll hear her in English in her voice. Uh, and it will be a significant technology breaking down language barriers. And as you can see, this is on the horizon. I mean, this is working in prototype form, and it's all running just on a notebook computer. Uh, within a few years, uh, this will be, I'd say within 24 months, will be available as a business service. Uh, within five years, this will be a routine service from your cell phone. So you'll just be able to call people up and just uh, the way you select different options. Today, you'll just select, okay, I want English to German, and you'll be able to speak to someone in another country, uh, overcoming the language barrier. Our ability to misunderstand each other will remain unimpaired, however. <laughs> and this is a good example of some of the advantages of, of machine intelligence. One advantage of machine intelligence, machines can share their knowledge. If I spend years learning French, and you saw the, the, uh, the result of that, uh, I can't just download that knowledge to you. I can give you a tip on a good teacher and a good book, but you've got to learn that knowledge the same painstaking way that I did. But machines can instantly share their knowledge. This is a good example of that. We spent years training one research computer how to recognize human speech. And it started out by making errors, and it's actually a process that emulates using something called neural nets and Markov models, which are simplified mathematical models of the way we believe certain neural circuits work. And these methods are imperfect, and they make mistakes, and we then correct the mistakes. We have thousands of hours of recorded speech uh, annotated with the correct uh, transcription. When the system makes a mistake, it's automatically told, no, that's wrong, this is what it really was, and it corrects uh, the, adjust the sort of neurotransmitter concentration analogs in its software, and it makes, does a little bit better job the next time. And we've done this for years, gradually teaching one research computer to be better and better at recognizing speech, and now it's good enough to be a, a commercial product. Well, if you want your computer to recognize speech, it doesn't have to go through that same process of learning it painstakingly. You can just load the program instantly. My knowledge of French or any other subject, where, where is that in my brain? Well, it's, it's represented as a, as a pattern of information, extremely complex pattern of interneuronal connections and neurotransmitter concentrations. And we don't have quick downloading ports on those patterns to so just load another pattern of interneuronal connections and and neurotransmitter concentrations and the other neural details that represents my learning. But as we build non-biological equivalents of these biological processes, we're not leaving out those quick downloading ports, so we can in fact load a pattern that represents knowledge, and that's one advantage of machine intelligence. Machines are also potentially much faster. It's amazing that our brains evolve through natural biological selection, but the circuitry that it came up with is very slow. The electrochemical information processes in our brain compute about 200 calculations per second. Our electronic circuits are already uh, 10 million times faster. Machines are also inherently, can be much more accurate when, when they, we want them to be. I'm, I'm hard pressed to remember a handful of phone numbers. I didn't remember the address of this museum on the way over. 
but machines can remember billions of things with extreme accuracy, and sometimes we fault them for that. We say, well, machines are so precise, they could never deal with the kind of unpredictable, uh, imprecise uh, phenomena such as human emotion, but I want to come back to that because I think that machines are not barred from representing uh, skills like recognizing and responding appropriately to human emotion. And that, in fact, represents, I think, the cutting edge of human intelligence. Emotion is not something kind of stuck on on the side. Our ability to be affectionate, to love, to recognize humor, to get the joke, to be funny, to, rec to recognize fear, these, these human emotions is really the cutting edge of human emotions. These are the most complex things we do, the most difficult things to recreate in a machine, and indeed we have not yet done so. But I'm going to talk about some scenarios where machines will be able to achieve these kinds of uh, complex, subtle, rich, deep, unpredictable skills that humans now excel in. And when they combine that with the advantages that they already have on sharing knowledge, speed, and accuracy of memory, that will be a very formidable combination. And then I'd like to touch upon what that will mean for the human-machine civilization, because I think this is part of the human-machine civilization. It's emerging from it. We're already very intimate with our computers, but I'll, but I'll come back to that. If we want to talk about where machine intelligence is going, there are two aspects to consider. One is the hardware capacity, the basic speed, memory capacity of computation as, as compared to the human brain. Because the computers today, like this machine here, it doesn't have all of the subtle, endearing qualities that we associate with humans. Because for one thing, it's a million times simpler than the human brain. It has a million times less capacity than the human brain. So just basic capacity is a necessary but not sufficient condition to recreate human intelligence. The other aspect then is the software, the organization of those resources. But let's talk first about the basic hardware uh, requirements for emulating human intelligence. We have about 100 billion neurons, or an average of about 1,000 connections from one neuron to another. That's 100 trillion connections. The calculations or information processing takes place in the connections. So that's a 100 trillion fold parallelism. We have 100 trillion things going on in our brains at the same time. And that's one of the architectural uh, aspects of the human brain that allows it to be as powerful as it is. As I mentioned, those, those calculations are very slow. 200 calculations per second times 100 trillion is 20 million billion calculations per second, or 20 billion MIPS. And this right here is maybe about 500 MIPS. So we have a ways to go in terms of basic capacity. Now, how many people here have heard of Moore's Law? Well, many, many hands went up. E even three or four years ago, uh, very few hands would go up. Five or six years ago, even in a technical audience of computer science people, not that many people were familiar with this phenomenon. But it has become quite evident with all of the devices that you're using becoming more and more powerful at a very fast uh, rate. Computers and the basic electronic uh, technology that they're based on are, is growing exponentially. And Moore's Law, which states literally that the size of a transistor, which are not quite this big, but they're microscopic in size, but they're growing, they're diminishing by 50% every two years. So every two years you can put twice as many transistors on an integrated circuit. So that's twice as much stuff, twice as much memory, twice as much computation uh, for the same price every two years. Because they're smaller, the electrons have less distance to travel, so they're actually run twice as fast. So you have twice as much stuff running twice as fast, that's a quadrupling of the price performance of computation every two years. But within, and there's arguments, I've been on panels where people, where the pessimists say 10 years and the optimists say 20 years, but that seems to be the span. With 10 to 20 years from now, those key features of the transistors will be just a few atoms in width. We won't be able to shrink them anymore. So will that be the end of this glorious exponential growth of computation that we've seen in recent years? And that's a really important question when we examine the 21st century, because if that phenomena is going to asymptote to some limit that we can't exceed, then we'll, 20 years from now, we'll have very powerful computers. In fact, just following Moore's law for 15 years will get us $2,000 notebook, $1,000 personal computers that are as powerful as the human brain, but then it would level off. Or alternatively, if this phenomenon is going to continue through the 21st century, that's quite a different vision of the future. So one of the things I did is I put 
uh, 49 famous computers on a logarithmic chart, which I will show you, and this should be easier than running this demo. Okay, this is an exponential chart. As you go up to a, another horizontal line, it, uh, it represents multiplying computation by a factor of 100. So a straight line on, on a chart like this would mean exponential growth. And in case you can't see the actual numbers, it goes from 1900 up to 2000. So at the lower left, there's the uh, computer that was used in the uh, 1890 census. Uh, 1940 is the computer that Turing used uh, to uh, crack the German Enigma code to give a transcript of all the Nazi messages to Churchill, who actually refused to use them. So when he was warned that Coventry was going to be bombed, he refused to warn Coventry because he was afraid that uh, the Germans would uh, realize that their code had been cracked. But then in the Battle of Britain, he did use the information and it enabled England to win the Battle of Britain. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have had a place to launch our D-Day invasion. Uh, 1956 is the uh, vacuum tube-based computer that CBS used to predict the election of Eisenhower. The upper right-hand corner, there's the computer you just bought your nephew for Christmas. And one thing that we can see is that this exponential growth of computing didn't start with Moore's Law, because Moore's Law is the law of integrated circuits. It started back in 1900 with electromechanical computing, Moore's Law is not the first, but the fifth paradigm to provide, provide exponential growth of computing. We had electromechanical calculators, relay-based computers, vacuum tube-based computers, discrete transistors, and now integrated circuits. The other thing we see is that that's not a straight line. That's another exponential. There's actually exponential growth in the rate of exponential growth. We doubled computation every three years at the beginning of the century, every two years in the middle of the century, and now we're doubling it every one year. So. What, what we see is that every time a paradigm was going to run out of steam, some other paradigm was there waiting in the wings to take over. There were shrinking vacuum tubes in the 50s, and finally they couldn't shrink them anymore and still maintain the necessary vacuums. Transistors came along, which are not just a small tube. It's a completely different paradigm. Paradigm shift keeps the exponential growth going. And the sixth paradigm is already working in laboratories, uh, which is molecular computing in three dimensions. Chips, even though they're very impressive and very dense, and the features are very small, are flat. There's only one layer of circuitry, and our brain is organized in three dimensions. We live in a three-dimensional world. Why not use the third dimension? And one technology called nanotubes, which is building electronic circuits out of pentagonal arrays of carbon atoms, is working in laboratories. And this is uh, building electronic circuits at the molecular level uh, in three dimensions. So a one-inch cube of nanotube circuitry would actually be a million times more powerful than the human brain in basic capacity. And there are actually seven or eight different technologies being developed to compute in three dimensions. If we, if we look at where this will take us in the 21st century, At the left part of this chart, you see the 1900 to 2000 progression that you saw before, compressed, and this then carries it through the 21st century. Uh, and this is actually conservative because this actually only projected one level of exponential growth. It's actually two. And I have been collecting more data and refining this model, but it's, uh, it's pretty, this is pretty close to accurate, at least based on the data that we have thus far. And what we see is right now, $1,000 of computation is somewhere between an insect and a, brain, and a mouse brain. Uh, and, uh, of course, an insect and a mouse brain are well designed and optimized for doing insect and mouse tasks. Uh, computers, as you can see, can already emulate human tasks in very narrow domains, but they don't have the broad range and flexibility of human intelligence. By 2019, $1,000 of computation, they won't be organized in these rectangular boxes. I'll talk a little bit more about how, in fact, the form factor of computers will disappear. They'll disappear into our clothing and even into our bodies and brains. But $1,000 of computation by 2019 
uh, will be equal uh, to that 20 billion MIPS of the human brain. By 2029, it'll take a village of human brains, a thousand of them, to emulate a thousand dollars of computation. By 2050, a thousand dollars of computation will be equal to 10 billion human brains, or all biological human brains on Earth. Because I might be off by a year or two on that <laughs> projection. Uh, I did, based on this model, actually project in the 80s that uh, a computer would take the World Chess Championship by trying to figure out how many moves you had to look ahead and what kind of computation that would require. Came out with 1998, which was which was off by a year. It happened in 1997. And if we look at this, even just using the Moore's Law paradigm, we will get to human brain and beyond uh, capacity in, in computers uh, before 2020. And as I mentioned before, that's a necessary but not a sufficient condition to, to recreate human intelligence. We could have a computer a thousand times more powerful than the human brain, and then you could compute your spreadsheet in a billionth of a second, but it doesn't necessarily give you human-level intelligence. Now, there are a number of different scenarios. One scenario for capturing what I call the software of intelligence, which is the knowledge, the organization of these resources, the exquisite organization that's represented in the human brain. One paradigm is to continue the work such as uh, speech recognition and, and all the work that's being done in artificial intelligence in, in many different areas, some of which is inspired by biological models. But in the limited time I have, I'd like to just share one, I think, compelling scenario which is, we have an example of human-level intelligence. We have 300 of them in this room, which is the human brain. And its methods are not hidden from us. We can already see inside the skull with, with brain scanning methods. And I mentioned earlier that brain scanning speeds and resolutions and bandwidths are also growing exponential. If, if you put that on a chart, you'd see the same kind of exponential growth in brain scanning, fueled in part by faster and faster computers. We can already see individual somas or nerve cells uh, in, in the brain. Uh, but here's a particularly uh, interesting scenario because it uses all technology that we can touch and feel today. There's already a scanning technology which if we put the scanning tip right near the neural features is able to scan the human brain with, with enough resolution to see every neural detail that we're interested in. The interneural connections, the neurotransmitter concentrations, the synaptic clefts, and so on. So all we have to do is then take that scanning tip and move it around in every spot in my brain and be able to capture a complete picture of my brain. Well, how are we going to do that without destroying the brain? Well, the way we're going to do that is we're going to shrink these scanners down to the size of, of blood cells and send them as little what I call nanobots or nanorobots. Uh, the, which are scanning robots the size of blood cells and send them through the human brain. And as they travel through the capillaries of the brain, they will travel by every neural feature. We need billions of them. And this is something that's actually feasible today except for the size and the cost. There's a technology called smart dust being developed, which are little one millimeter size robots that can fly, that can scan, that, have, that will have uh, ability to take pictures, transmit them, little micro flaps, uh, microtransmitters, all in the space of a little a tiny one millimeter dot, and this is something that's, uh, that's being developed right now. All the technology I'm describing can be built today, except we can't make billions of them inexpensively enough, and we can't make them small enough. But those exponential curves, where we can project the exponentially growing price performance, reduction of cost of electronics, and the exponentially shrinking uh, size of technology and miniaturization. Currently, we are shrinking technology. You've all seen this in your lifetimes of technology getting smaller and smaller. We're shrinking electronics, for example, right now at a speed of 5.6 per linear dimension per decade. So based on these trends, it's a conservative statement to say that we can send these nanobots in the bloodstream, uh, non-invasively, uh, within 30 years. And then they'll all be communicating with each other because they'll all be on a wireless local area network. And as they travel, they'll communicate with the web and they'll be able to create a complete picture uh, of my brain or any brain, uh, any human brain. Now, what are we going to do with this information? Well, one thing we're going to do is learn how, what the algorithms of the human brain are. It's not one big tabula rasa. There are hundreds of different regions of the brain. They're all organized differently. We have actually reverse engineered several of them 
Uh, the early auditory cortex does make some changes, transformations to sound information, auditory information, and we actually use those in this speech recognition based on reverse engineering of that particular region of the brain. Uh, this work that was done recently at the uh, San Diego Institute for Nonlinear Science, where they actually took a biological network from an animal, a spiny lobster, and they have a model of how those neurons work, a very detailed model, and they create an electronic equivalent, and then they took out some of the biological neurons, replaced it with electronic ones, based on their model, and the, this now hybrid biological, non-biological uh, network worked uh, the same way that the old biological network did. So we're already shown that we can reverse engineer uh, individual neurons, uh, substantial clusters of neurons. I talk about in my book uh, a number of projects where we've actually recreated clusters of now up to thousands of biological neurons and the, the non-biological equivalent works the same way. So as we can see all of this data, we are, have shown that we, can, we are already able to reverse engineer and understand the methods underlying human intelligence. And it will give us insight into human psychology, human cognitive capabilities, and also human dysfunction. We can also, I talk about in my book, uh, sort of philosophically perplexing scenario where we could just take that data, this complete dump of, let's say, my brain and reinstantiate it in a neural computer of sufficient capacity, which will happen in 2029. And the person that wakes up in the machine then, because it's a perfect copy of my brain, will say, hey, this technology really works. I grew up in Queens and I uh, went to MIT. I sold a few artificial intelligence companies. I gave this lecture on the Millennium Eve uh, at the Smithsonian. And I walked into the scanner there and woke up in the machine here. This, this technology really works. You'll have to give him a body and we don't have time to really talk about that because a disembodied mind will quickly get depressed, but I do have a chapter in my book about 21st century bodies, virtual bodies and virtual reality, uh, bodies created from swarms of, of nanobots, uh, nanotechnology, nano-engineered bodies where we, we will be able to, we're already, in fact, well down this path, we're already further along in recreating our bodies than we are in recreating our minds. Uh, and it does bring up issues of, of consciousness. Uh, one could say that this copy isn't really a perfect copy. It's close enough that this person that seems to emerge uh, seems human, but people will say, well, okay, it does seem human. It can pass the Turing test if I interact with him. Uh, he seems kind of human, but it's just a machine. It's not squirting neurotransmitters. It's not based on DNA-guided protein synthesis. So it's not conscious. Seems to be conscious, but isn't conscious. Well, we have these debates right now with animals. Uh, I mean, I think my cat's conscious, and other people say no, because they haven't met my cat. <laughs> but people say no, if, if an entity doesn't have human-level language, it's not conscious. It's just these animals are really just like machines. There's really no way to ultimately settle that debate. Uh, we can make arguments about it. We can say, well, look at this animal's behavior, or look at this non-biological uh, entity that's emulating human intelligence. Look at its behavior. It's very much acting like a human being, or it's emulating certain... Uh, ability to deal with emotion and humor that's similar to a human being, I think it's conscious. And other people say, well, no, you've got to be biological to be conscious. There's no scientific or objective way to actually settle that. We can't, science is about objective measurement, and the whole nature of consciousness is subjective experience, and we can't, we can make arguments about the correlates of subjective experience, we can't directly measure subjective experience. But these entities ultimately will be very intelligent, and the real scenario is not going to be primarily or even uh, uh, fundamentally uh, recreating specific humans, this whole downloading or uploading issue, but really taking this information, just as we now have the human genome information, and learning how it works and using those insights into our intelligent machines and recreating machines that have the capacity of, of, of the human brain and that will have the software created from this reverse engineering process. It's a very similar process that's going on right now with the human genome. And when that project was announced 12 years ago, skeptics said, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, at the speed with which we can scan the genome, you can, they showed the speed of the best machines at that time. It was only 12 years ago. It's going to take 10,000 years to scan the whole human genome. And yet here we are, 12 years later, and. Uh, the consensus is we will complete that project in one or two years. 
because the speed with which you can scan the genome, just like these speeds, are growing exponentially. And now we're beginning to reverse engineer that data. It's just raw data. We're beginning to understand how that data creates proteins and how the proteins create the different functions of life. When we have this raw data from a brain scan, we will, it'll take us time to reverse engineer it. And let me end by just talking about really how I think this will affect our civilization, how we will interact with it. And there's many different uh, ramifications, but Fundamentally, I don't see this as an invasion of intelligent machines coming over the horizon to compete with us. It's emerging from within our human machine civilization. We're already very dependent on computers. We had that concern with Y2K. I believe that we've been able to rectify that, but it did show how dependent we are on our machines. If all the computers in the world stopped today, civilization would grind to a halt. And that wasn't true as recently as 30 years ago. Uh, the way we're going to utilize these powerful machines that have enormous intellectual capabilities is really by amplifying our own capabilities. And we come back to the nanobots. The nanobots will not only scan the brain, but they'll be able to actually interact with the brain and amplify it. This is again using technology we can touch and feel today. There's technology, uh, which I talk about in the book, called a neuron transistor, where if this device, the electronic device, is next to a neuron, it can actually communicate in both directions with that neuron. It can detect the neuron firing, it can cause the neuron to fire, and it can also suppress the neuron from firing. There's two-way communication between the biological neuron and this electronic neuron transistor. So, and we already have, we're already putting intelligent machines in our brains. I have a deaf friend who, uh, is, I mean, who's profoundly deaf, but I can now talk to him on the phone because of his cochlear implant, which is a neural implant. Uh, there are devices for Parkinson's patients that actually replaces that group of cells that gets scrambled in a Parkinson's patient. And uh, this doctor in France has demonstrated it by having these patients wheeled in with the device turned off. He can control it from outside their brains, which is a little scary. Uh, but then he flips it on and suddenly their symptoms disappear because this electronic device in their brain is actually doing what, this, what the cells used to do that were destroyed by the Parkinson's patient. But people have said uh, earlier when I was talking about neural implants, this is, well, that's very interesting. And sure, a Parkinson's patient or maybe a deaf individual would want to have surgery to, to recover these lost capabilities. But how many people are going to want to have brain surgery to expand their normal capabilities? And the scenario that uh, we'll see in 30 or 40 years will not require surgery. We'll send these nanobots in the brain. They'll have these neuron transistors. They'll travel to specific spots in the brain, billions of them could be scattered throughout the brain. And they'll communicate uh, wirelessly, uh, non-invasively, uh, just as we can do today with these neur neuron transistors and be able to influence what, what the brain is doing. Now, let me give you an example in terms of virtual reality. If the, the nanobots would take up positions by every nerve fiber coming from every one of our senses, our eyes, ears, tactile sense. And then if we want to be in real reality, uh, the nanobots simply sit there and do nothing. And then you experience uh, real, um, real reality the normal way with the signals coming from your real senses. If you want to experience virtual reality, the nanobots shut down the signals coming from your real senses and replace them with the signals that you would ex have experienced if you were in the virtual environment. The computers will figure out what that should be and, and, and create those uh, signals. Very much like the virtual reality that you can experience today in arcade games that require these bulky helmets. That's crude, the resolution's low, technology always starts out crude, but this will be virtual reality from within. It'll be just as detailed as real reality, and that'll be the nature of the World Wide Web in 2029. Going to a website will mean entering a virtual reality environment. And you can go there by yourself or you can go there with other people. So if uh, you and I were in this virtual environment, then when you decided to lift your hand, uh, the nanobots would suppress your real hand from, from moving. Instead, it would move your virtual hand. You'd see it move up in front of your face, and I'd see you move your hand up in front of your face. And then if we shook hands, I'd feel your hand. You'd feel my hand. You'd be able to interact with other people in, in virtual environments. Meetings like this would be, we wouldn't have to be in the physically the same geographic spot, and we wouldn't have to, I mean, this is a lovely auditorium, but we could met in a 
Mozambique Game Preserve or on a Cancun beach and feel the warm, moist air against our faces and so forth. And that'll be the nature of the World Wide Web in 2029. These same nanobots can also then expand our cognitive capabilities. They can create new neural connections. Uh, a neuron over here and a neuron over here can actually create a new interneural connection. It's not physical, it's virtual because they're communicating wirelessly, because as I mentioned, they're all on our wireless local area network. So they can actually expand our memories, expand our cognitive and pattern recognition capabilities. And 20, this technology will begin to be feasible in 2030, but by 2040, 2050, when you meet a person who's an ordinary person of biological descent, uh, they will have normal biological processes in their brains, but they will also have uh, these non-biological processes. And we'll begin to see some of this quite soon. Uh, first, not inside our brains, but I just uh, actually a few months ago wore these gla special glasses that paint images right on your retina. And I'd say by 2004, 2005, uh, computers like that will disappear. Certainly by 2009, you won't see them anymore. Uh, the displays will be painted right on our retina. That can create a virtual display that harbors an air, or it can actually create fully immersive visual uh, virtual reality. Similarly, discrete devices can provide the auditory uh, por portion of virtual reality. So at least visual and auditory virtual reality uh, will be something we'll actually walk around with by 2009. And, and that's certainly sufficient for, for meetings like this. The tactile sense, uh, th there will be physical devices that'll provide the tactile sense. So people can have all kinds of encounters from business negotiations to sensual encounters in virtual environments. The virtual reality from within, which is really what's required to be fully convincing and completely uh, place us in a virtual environment that includes aromas and, and all kinds of physical sensations, that we won't begin to see till 2030. But 2040, 2050, uh, virtual reality will be so compelling that we'll be spending more and more of our time there. And this is a technology which will be expanding human intelligence. That's the primary application I see of this technology becoming more and more intimate, first being woven into our clothing and in our eyeglasses and in and around our bodies, and then finally making its way into our bodies non-invasively, expanding our ability to experience environments, expanding human capability. Uh, these virtual realities, in fact, can not only enhance our visual, auditory, and sensual experiences, but can also enhance our emotional reactions. I talk about neurological correlates of emotion in the, in the book. Uh, there's many rich implications of this kind of technology, but I think that's what we will see for, for this first half of the 21st century is a great expansion of human capability and experience and creativity through this very intimate connection with non-biological intelligence. Well, thank you very much. I think we, do we have time for a couple of questions? I think we have time just for one or two. There are microphones on either side, so we would ask that if you've got a question, that uh, you go to a mic. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, we're already seeing a phenomena where the hardware of computers today is sort of outstripping the software. I mean, I, I refer to new uh, gigahertz PCs where we're still using a paradigm. Uh, Windows is still a very old paradigm for how to interact with them. Uh, do you see a similar thing happening where the hardware, according to your chart, is getting powerful, but our software really is A, inadequate, and B, doesn't take advantage of it, and C, doesn't have its experience? Well, I think software using some of the old paradigms, including some of the old artificial intelligence paradigms, like expert systems, where you try to hand code every rule, uh, is being outstripped and will be outstripped uh, by these very powerful uh, hardware architectures. What we need to do is emulate biological systems, and that's, that's the area of software that I've been in, which is pattern recognition, where we actually create systems that are not programmed in advance, that learn from their own experiences, that are able to correct their errors, and are actually patterned on at least the crude models that we have currently of, of how uh, biological neural networks work. And that's uh, an example is the speech recognition. Now, this system here, uh, automatically will become more powerful as we get more powerful computers because it can scale its own capability. And we've tried it on computers that are 100 times more powerful and its accuracy 
uh, and ability to deal with language goes up dramatically. So we already have systems that are where the software is actually ahead of the hardware. But in order to really fully capture the subtleties of human intelligence, even understand what that is, uh, we'll require reverse engineering the human brain. And I talk about in my book many examples where we're doing that already on a small scale, but that's really where some of the future secrets of, of software-based uh, intelligence will come. Could you tell me, could you foresee this technology of essentially granting indefinite length of life to human beings? And secondly, can you foresee that these artificial intelligence could become like HAL in a Space Odyssey 2001 and sort of override a human host? Well, there's two very interesting questions. I'll try to answer them quickly. Uh, when you get a new personal computer, do you throw all your files away? No, you copy them over to the new computer. Your files have a longevity that's independent of the hardware they, they reside on. If, you, if the hardware dies, hopefully you've made a backup and you can uh, recreate those files. So the files do not live forever because if you ignore them, they'll get out of date and the formats will change. If you've tried to uh, recreate some old uh, file from a 1970 mini computer, you'll know what I'm talking about. But the longevity of software is different from hardware. But we have information in our brains also, and in fact I've estimated that at thousands of trillions of bytes of information. There's information there representing my skills, my memories, my uh, recollections, and so forth. And right now there's an intimate nexus between the longevity of that mind file and the hardware. When the hardware dies, our personality, all that information uh, dies with it. When we have the ability to capture it, uh, that file can live beyond the hardware and can be reinstantiated in other hardware. It raises a philosophical issue, is that me? Or is that somebody who does a very good imitation of me, uh, but is really somebody else? And a good argument to say that it's really somebody else is you could scan my brain while I'm sleeping, and this will be a feasible scenario with these nanobots, recreate my brain and some new uh, non-biological hardware. And then if you come to me in the morning and say, hey, good news, Ray, we've successfully scanned your brain and reinstantiated your mind in this other computer in the next room, we don't need your old biological body and brain anymore, I may see a flaw in that philosophical perspective. From an outsider's perspective, Ray Kurzweil's ideas and skills has been preserved and can continue in some other form. From my own subjective conscious perspective, it's a little more complex and more subtle. Uh, so it's a form of longevity. Uh, it's not necessarily immortality because even software doesn't last forever uh, for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but we will be able to have our mind file in some form continue certainly by the end of the 21st century, in, in non-biological mediums. And as for the HAL perspective, there are downsides to this technology. Bioengineering, for example, which exists today, is already very dangerous. It's going to cure disease on the one hand, and we're on the very early stages of that revolution. On the other hand, the means exist in a routine bioengineering college laboratory to create a pathogen that would be more destructive than an atomic bomb. So there's always been positives and destructive sides of technology. And these new technologies that are emerging in the 21st century will be even more powerful. And I tend to be an optimist in that I think the constructive applications of these technologies will uh, dominate, because it's said that an optimist is someone who, when he falls from a 10-story building, is heard to say as he passes the fourth floor that so far everything has gone well. <laughs> but uh, the, the story of the 21st century hasn't been written, and it's really in our hands to shape this technology uh, to emphasize our shared human values. Not that we have a consensus on what those are, but that's the challenge of the 21st century. Thank you, Thank you very much for helping us imagine this coming century.